Well, thank you very much. It's truly an honor to be here. Uh, Raphael Sims, the former captain of the, CS, the infamous CSS Alabama, introduced his memoirs with the following. The cruise of ship is a biography. The ship becomes a personification. She not only walks the waters like a thing of life, <clears throat> but she speaks in moving accents to those capable of interpreting her. A ship can be, therefore, a central character in a life story through which we view the past more clearly. Following in the wake of her sisters, the CSS Shenandoah was the last of the rebel raiders. Her mission, to continue destruction of Union commerce, so effectively advanced by the Alabama, now resting silently on the bottom of the English Channel after her fiery clash with the USS Kearsarge in June 1864. Shenandoah Cruise has many fascinating storylines. I will cover a few, but for the rest, I encourage you to buy the book. <laughs> we'll, sum we'll summarize the cruise of the Shenandoah. We'll talk about the officers, about the strategy of Confederate commerce raiding, about the technology, and about the legality in, in international law of Confederate commerce raiding, and finally, the impact. From October 1864 to November 1865, Shenandoah carried the conflict around the globe to the ends of the earth, through every extreme of sea and storm. She was purchased from British owners, armed and commissioned near the island of Madeira. At almost the same moment, in an ocean away, as autumn blazed the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia, Phil Sheridan routed Jubal Early's rebels at the Battle of Cedar Creek, a bloody ending to the Second Valley Campaign. The very day that lost one Shenandoah to the Confederacy saw the birth of another. Shenandoah destroyed eight Yankee vessels on her way around the Cape of Good Hope and across the Indian Ocean. In Melbourne, she caused a sensation. The people split into contentious political camps. One welcomed and celebrated their guests. The other demanded her immediate departure, while the royal governor and his bureaucracy muddled and vacillated. This was the war down under. The British colony of Victoria had much in common with both the Confederate and the United States and manifested some of the same differences. <coughs> Leaving Melbourne, Shenandoah sailed into the vast Pacific. At the island of Pohnpei, she captured four American whalers. Southern gentlemen enjoyed a tropical holiday, mingling with an exotic warrior society that was more like them than they knew. The history and customs of this land present both intriguing parallels and stark contrasts with the Confederacy. Burning Yankee whalers illuminated alien surroundings <clears throat> while Richmond went up in flames. This uniquely American conflagration flared simultaneously at both ends of the earth. As lonely rebels slept under tropic stars, guns fell silent at Appomattox. With morale restored by rest, recreation, and destruction, Shenandoah sailed once more, leaving an enduring legacy in this faraway place. While the war struggled to conclusion and the nation began to bind its wounds, Shenandoah invaded the north, the deep cold of the Bering Sea. She fired the last gun in the Civil War, ten weeks after Appomattox, set the land of the midnight sun aglow with flaming Yankee whalers, and almost became trapped by ice. <clears throat> Shenandoah captured 24 vessels in one week, an unprecedented accomplishment that a few months before would have been greeted with jubilation in the south and despair in the north. Off the coast of California, a passing British vessel delivered news of the end of the war. Former Confederates became pariahs, men without a country, profession, or future, or fortune, and presumably subject to imprisonment or hanging as pirates. Their fears amplified by great distance, these Southerners could only imagine. Homes destroyed, families destitute and starving, men folk imprisoned, dead, or executed. On, on 6 November 1865, Shenandoah limped into Liverpool. Captain Waddell lowered the last Confederate banner without defeat or surrender and abandoned his tired vessel to the British. <clears throat> he and his officers went ashore to, to reconstitute their lives. This is, as Admiral Sims describes, a biography of a cruise and a microcosm of the Confederate American experience. 
I claim for her officers and men a triumph over their enemies and over every obstacle. And for myself, I claim having done my duty, recalled Captain James Waddell. Shenandoah's officers represented a cross-section of the Confederacy, from Old Dominion First families through the Deep South aristocracy to a middle-class Missourian. They included a nephew of Robert E. Lee, a grandnephew of founder George Mason, a son-in-law to Raphael Sims, grandsons of men who fought at George Washington's side, and an uncle of Theodore Roosevelt. All except the captain and the ship's surgeon were under the age of the 25. The name Shenandoah honored the place, wrote Lieutenant William Whittle, where the brave Stonewall Jackson always so discomfited the enemy. The burning there of homes over defenseless women and children made the selection of the name not inappropriate for a cruiser, which was to lead a torchlight procession around the world and into every ocean. The men of Shenandoah already had suffered three and a half years of bloody, discouraging conflict aboard puny gunboats and lumbering ironclads up and down the interior waters of their fledgling country, frequently on the same vessels and in the same battles. A few were veterans of Alabama's two-year cruise. <coughs> These men considered themselves Americans, Southerners, rebels, and warriors embarking on the voyage of their lives defending their country as they understood it, and pursuing a difficult and dangerous mission in which they succeeded spectacularly after it no longer mattered. Having sacrificed careers in the Navy that nurtured them, they struggled to reproduce its essence in their new Navy, <clears throat> one with few ships. Two of the five lieutenants had, deep water, had been deep water sailors in the United States Navy, and one in the merchant service. Four of them had attended the new Naval Academy in Annapolis, and two midshipmen had been appointed to the academy before secession changed their loyalties. Two of the lieutenants followed distinguished naval fathers who had served in, the, in Pacific exploring expeditions, in anti-slavery patrols on the coast of Africa, with Commodore Perry at the opening of Japan, <coughs> and during the Mexican War. One had been Naval Academy Commandant of Midshipmen. Both fathers became senior officers in Confederate service. Upon first sighting the ship, Midshipman John Mason recorded in his journal, One thing, however, pleased me very much. She was a full rig ship, and I looked at her three tall masts and her yards and rigging. I thought, what a fine opportunity I would have of learning seamanship, and I made up my mind to make the most of it. Watching an enemy vessel burn, wrote Lieutenant Francis Chu, was a grand and peculiar sight. I was saddened at the thought of being in duty bound to such work. I felt very sorry for them, even after thinking of the hellish work of the Yankees at home, or the tears they have wrung from one's happy, beaming eyes. No, none of us took pleasure in it, none but fiends could. Ship surgeon Dr. Charles Lining remarked about the vast and empty Pacific Ocean. Rain, calms, and baffling winds seemed to baffle us. Nothing in sight, not even a bird. In fact, the region seems to be the abomination of isolation. Three heritages drove the men of Shenandoah. As grandsons of revolutionaries, they believed profoundly in liberty and democracy. They also shared uh, they also shared the ancient social mores of the Southern gentleman class, along with its timeless dedication to family, country, duty, and personal integrity. These characteristics were reinforced in their central identities as officers of the Confederate States Navy, to which they applied the Southern martial tradition just as energetically as did their army brothers in arms. The observations of these Southerners, looking back from the most remote and alien surroundings imaginable, along with the viewpoints of the people they encountered, provide a truly unique perspective of the war, with elements both common to and differing from land-bound compatriots. <clears throat> Commerce warfare had been around since the 16th century, when Queen Elizabeth I dispatched her gentlemen adventurers to prey on Spanish shipping. 
European conflicts for the next two and a half centuries saw almost continuous commerce war destruction on all sides. Americans vigorously warred upon the enemy trade in every contest leading up to 1861. President Lincoln was determined to interdict commerce with seceded states, but the only effective mechanism in international law was a formal blockade, which he declared on 19 April 1861, one week after Fort Sumter. To avoid conflict over trade, Queen Victoria officially proclaimed neutrality in May 1861, formally recognizing the Confederacy as a belligerent and extending the protections of neutral status to, it, to British vessels, as long as they respected the blockade and did not carry contraband. Belligerents had three superior rights in international law. The right to halt and inspect suspect ships of all nations on the high seas, the right to confiscate military supplies, contraband, intended for the enemy, and the right to blockade the enemy. Confederates turned immediately to trade warfare as a, as a primary pillar of their naval strategy. The very able Secretary of the Navy wrote, the enemy's commerce constitutes one of his reliable sources of national wealth, no less than one of his best schools for seamen, and we must strike it if possible. Captain Waddell of Shenandoah would note, the war was only to be stopped on the mercenary principle of showing that it would no longer pay to keep it up. Mallory had no illusions about cutting off commerce to the north, but he did have two objectives. One, make the war so costly to power for northern shipping and whaling interests that they would campaign vigorously for peace, even at the expense of southern independence. And two, weaken the blockade by drawing off all <coughs> Union warships to chase down rebel raiders. In today's terms, this was asymmetric warfare. With no Navy at all to begin with, Southerners relied initially on tried and true privateering. Private cupidity will always furnish the means for this description of warfare, wrote Raphael Sims in early 1861. Even New England ships and New England capital would be at your service. The system of privateering would be analogous to the militia system on land. The new Confederate Congress duly authorized letters of mark. A few rebel raiders made it to sea in 1861, a few rebel privateers, but with short-lived success. European powers had declared an end to privateering in the Paris Convention of 1856 following the Crimean War. Upon commencement of American hostilities, they denied both contestants permission to bring captured vessels into neutral ports for adjudication and sale, while the blockade restricted southern harbors. For the first time in 300 years, the business was not profitable. The ever resourceful Secretary Mallory determined to build or buy vessels configured solely for commerce destruction and fund them from the Treasury a practice not prevalent since the development of the big gun warship centuries before. The strategy was to dispatch as many state-financed commissioned cruisers as possible among regular trading routes, taking any Yankees found there. Shenandoah was instructed to do the enemy's property the greatest injury in the shortest time. Confederates took every advantage of their status and insisted on their rights. The government could contract loans, purchase arms and ships in neutral nations, and commission cruisers with the power of search and seizure on the high seas. Ships flying the rebel flag were to be accorded the same status as those of any other nation, and were to be treated fairly with regard to assistance, supplies, and repairs in neutral ports. <coughs> Wherever Confederate cruisers appeared, U.S. Embassy and consular authorities vehemently opposed any support whatever, insisting that they were simply rebels and pirates and should be treated as such despite official belligerent status. Lacking clear direction from parent governments, foreign officials struggled with the irreconcilable demands of the combatants. Meanwhile, the strategy of Union Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells with respect to Confederate raiders was primarily reactive he focused his resources on the blockade, reluctantly dispatching a few warships to pursue rebels where they were reported to be, usually too little too late. 
Before the late 19th century, the term cruiser applied to smaller warships operating independently of a fleet, engaged primarily in scouting and commerce destruction. Too light and lightly armed to stand in the line of battle, frigates and sloops of war served these functions in the sailing navies. Cruisers were not an identifiable ship class. And then steam arrived. The CSS Florida and CS Alabama were prototypes of Civil War cruisers, built from the keel up for the purpose and magnificently suited. Small but sustainable for long cruises, light, fast, and lightly armed. But most of the others were civilian vessels, converted, armed, and commissioned as raiders. All but one of those merchant conversions were only marginally successful due to lack of speed, sustainability, capacity, and or cruising range. Shenandoah was the best of the converted merchantmen and ranks as one of the top commerce destroyers of all time. She was a British extreme clipper built in Glasgow for the China tea trade. Very similar to the famous Cuddy Sark, the last of the type, now preserved at Greenwich. <coughs> she carried a cloud of canvas, having crossjack royal studding sails, jib topsail, and all the high flyers. Shenandoah was the epitome of the ancient art of tall ship construction and a prime example of the new technology of the machine age. She was the first composite clipper, combining the advantages of iron frames planked with six inches of East India teak sheathed in copper. Her lower mass and bowsprit were iron. She had mechanical roller reefing topsails, steel yards, and wire standing rigging. Shenandoah was also the first auxiliary screw steamer, a sh clipper ship with a steam engine to assist in calms and contrary winds, driving her comfortably at nine knots. The propeller could be lifted clear of the water and the telescoping smokestack could be collapsed to reduce drag under sail. Clippers with engines were not commercially successful and only a few were built. The marginal advantage in faster passageway passages did not compensate it for the added expense and loss of cargo space for engine, fuel, and extra crewmen. But for commerce rating, the combination was perfect. In a single vessel of relatively low cost, the advantages of fast sail merged with steam propulsion with minimum armament against a vast merchant fleet almost exclusively under sail and virtually unarmed, and overwhelming tactical superiority. Under sail and or steam, Shenandoah could overtake almost any victim and outrun any enemy. <clears throat> the success of Confederate commerce raiders encouraged innovation in the U.S. Navy. Conventional steam-powered frigates and converted steam merchantmen had been relatively effective for blockade and coastal operations, but with few exceptions like Shenandoah, were not equal to the task of either defensive or offensive commerce warfare. In 1863, the U.S. secretly designed a new warship class specifically to hunt down rebels or, if necessary, to go after British trade should they intervene for the South. They were fast steam sloops in the terminology of the time. Secretary Wells described their role as ocean cruisers. By 1868, the USS Wampanoag was the fastest warship in the world able to steam across rough water at 17 knots, the work of renowned marine engineer B. F. Isherwood. The sleek hull, 355 feet long, 45 feet wide, was designed around a huge and complex steam propulsion system crowned by four stacks, with a light sailing rig and minimal armament as befitted the mission. Wampanoag had been a logical extension of the strategy behind Alabama and Shenandoah, now that privateering was dead, but with the end of the Civil War, the threat of British meddling no longer existed. She was decommissioned as too expensive to operate and maintain. Wampanoag was, however, a precursor of the cruiser's warship types developed later in the century, and which would have been important component in which have been important components of all navies since, but not as commerce destroyers. Shenandoah represented a truly novel breed 
heroic worship to Southerners, feared privateer to citizens of neutral trading nations, hated pirate to Northerners. The status of Confederate commerce cruisers in the antiquated and complex body of international law was ambiguous, causing a great deal of rancor between London, Washington, and Richmond. The most effective rebel raiders, Alabama, Florida, and Shenandoah, were British built, armed, equipped, largely manned, and sold to the Confederacy. Central to the controversy was the, the legality of such vessels as legitimate articles of neutral trade, along with British obligations to accord them equal status with United States warships. Alabama's dramatic and destructive crews became a cause celeb, an illustration of the pitfalls of neutrality <coughs> and a source of extreme acrimony between the two nations. Shenandoah's visit to Melbourne throws these issues into relief. The people were fascinated by, if not entirely informed about, their faraway cousin's conflict. As word spread of her arrival, hundreds of sightseers streamed along the shore. Boats under steam, sail, and oar descended from every direction to view their first and only Confederate visitor. <clears throat> the Shenandoah is regarded as the Alabama rendezvous or the phoenix-like product of the wreck of that world-famed vessel, noted the Melbourne Argus. The ship was besieged by visitors, traveling as far as 300 miles, evoking a carnival atmosphere. An estimated 10,000 came aboard in one day. If we can judge from outward signs, we are likely to find a good deal of sympathy here among the people, wrote Lieutenant Whittle. The royal governor and his advisors were less enthusiastic, being sensitive to the convoluted diplomatic and legal issues surrounding the visit. Her Majesty's ministers demanded that colonial officials maintain both the fact and the appearance of neutrality in the American War, a delicate balancing act that had proven extremely difficult. Old and contentious issues concerning the rights and responsibilities of neutrals resurfaced, and there was no middle ground. <clears throat> William Blanchard, U.S. Consul in Melbourne, fired off a letter to the governor. I call upon your excellency to cause the said Shenandoah to be seized for piratical acts. She did not come within the Queen's neutrality proclamation, he maintained, never having entered a port of the so styled Confederate States of America. I therefore protest any aid or comfort being extended to said piratical vessel in any of the ports of this colony. This was the initial salvo of a fierce diplomatic war, a barrage of protests and affidavits. It must be evident, Blanchard contended, that all presumptions of fact and law were against the legal character of the vessel, which had no legitimacy as a commissioned warship of a recognized nation. Shenandoah was a registered British merchant ship. She came from nowhere and destroyed without adjudication and without necessity. The undersigned will not doubt that your excellency will give so much weight and no more to a bit of bunting and a shred of gold lace as they deserve. <clears throat> the British never accepted the pirate thesis, however incessantly and vociferously it was proclaimed. The commissioning of warships came under national law, not international law. There was no requirement to have originated in or even visited the home country. It had taken 300 difficult years for Great Britain to establish a position of maritime supremacy. Rules of neutrality must be impartially enforced as a matter of example. On the other hand, they could not be so zealous as to establish precedents that would tie their hands in a future conflict where commerce raiders built in neutral ports could be turned against them. Ironically, the positions of the two governments were historically reversed. <coughs> As the world's most powerful maritime nation and largest trader, the English had dealt harshly with neutrals trading with the enemy, most recently during the French Wars of Revolution and Empire. Americans, on the other hand, had fought four wars in which freedom of commerce was a paramount issue, two with Great Britain, one with France, and one with the North African pirates. Now the tables were turned. The Union sought to impede trade with the Confederacy while the British struggled to uphold neutral rights for unrestricted trade with belligerence of non-contraband goods. <clears throat> However, upon the advice of his 
Crown law officers, the, governors responded, the governor responded to Consul Blanchard. There was no evidence of piratical acts, and whatever the previous history of Shenandoah, the government were, was bound to treat her as a ship of war belonging to a belligerent power. That did not, however, end the controversy in Melbourne. The people of Melbourne, like their English counterparts and many foreigners, did not comprehend the complexities of the war, but in an age tinged with romantic notions of honor and valor, they related to Alabama. She had been a tangible manifestation of the Confederacy. Her exploits brought the contest to them in the language of ocean commerce and ocean conflict, which they understood very well. Having no particular stake in the success of the Union or understanding of its concepts, many looked on the men of Alabama as valiant heroes fighting great odds. <coughs> Captain Sims was an international celebrity, at least as much as Lincoln, Grant, and Lee. Despite vehement protests from the United States, Confederate cruisers had been welcomed warmly in colonial ports such as Jamaica, Trinidad, and Gibraltar. The Alabama caused a stir in Cape Town in August 1863, with parties and balls in her honor. Later, just the rumors of her appearance off Hobson's Bay created a flurry of excitement in Melbourne. Much of this glamour transferred to Shenandoah, which is precisely what the Confederates intended. But a significant number of influential people of Melbourne were acutely worried about the visitors. The Melbourne Age wrote, wrote whatever may be the pretensions of the Shenandoah, she is strictly speaking but a privateer. The method may be strictly lawful, but is exceedingly inglorious, and they who engage in it are entitled to no honor. The day may come when the unoffending people of this colony may be made to suffer for the quarrels of nations in other hemisphere. <clears throat> there appeared to be little public debate of the central issues, union, secession, states' rights, slavery, pro-union sentiment focused on repugnance for commerce rating, dangers for the umbilical cords of trade with Europe and America, and local issues such as land reform and tariffs. The Civil War generated economic uncertainty even in Australia, with widely fluctuating prices and availability affecting huge quantities of imports. Despite these concerns, the preponderance of sympathy in Melbourne was for the South echoing perceptions and misperceptions of many in Great Britain and Europe. Conspicuous in gray uniforms, Shenandoah officers were approached in the streets, showered with social invitations, presented free open tickets by the railway company, voted members of the cricket club and the prestigious Melbourne club, and attended the theater gratis. Council Blanchard desperately applied every legal trip to have, trick to have Shenandoah seized, he delivered another broadside, defining her as an illegal and criminal rover of the sea. It was illegal under British law to fit out, equip, and arm ships for combat in wars where Great Britain was neutral. <coughs> Blanchard cited as precedent the hotly contested case of the screw, ste screw steamer Alexandra. In the spring of 1863, the American consul at Liverpool learned from his spies that Alexandra was being built as a Confederate cruiser and convinced British officials to seize the ship. But the Crown lost the case following lengthy court proceedings and the ship was returned to her owners. The British walked a fine line between proper discharge of international obligations and protections of lawful private enterprise. Their firms were making great profits selling ordnance to both sides. Dozens of blockade runners had been converted or built. Shipyards were inundated with profitable contracts, and ships were legitimate products of industry and trade. The Alexandra case was lost, maintained Blanchard, only because the government could not prove the owner's intent, which was to present the ship as a gift to the Confederate government. But Alexandra and Shenandoah were fitted out under similar circumstances for the same purposes, and proof of intent was that it was carried out, post hoc ergo propter hoc. Shenandoah's hostile crews, and therefore the offense, was still in progress, interrupted in Melbourne only to make it more effective thereafter. The vessel now lay in reach of British law and should be seized. On the inconvenient technicality that fitting out, arming, and equipping 
equipping had not been accomplished in British territory, as stated in the law. Blanchard claimed that she was prepared in England as a transport or store ship for a cruiser and then became a cruiser. Blanchard wanted it both ways. If Shenandoah was not a legitimate warship, she was a pirate. If she was legitimate, then she violated British law. But it was all to no avail. As long as they obeyed neutrality rules, Governor Darling had no incentive to act against the visitors, especially with many of his leading citizens in such vocal support of them. Until, that is, Blanchard received information that the Confederates were actively recruiting new crewmen from among the citizenry. Another clear violation of British domestic law. The governor acted with uncharacteristic dispatch, impounding the vessel while high and dry for repairs to the propeller shaft. Intense excitement ensued in the city with few neutral observers and rampant rumors of actual or impending violence. But upon further review, the royal law officers <coughs> concluded that the, government, that the governor did not have a good case and could be liable if the vessel were damaged. He was compelled to release Shenandoah to the wide derision of many citizens and the press. Repairs completed, Shenandoah once more attained her natural element, cheered by a crowd of spectators on adjacent wharfs, the colonial steamer of war Victoria, and a few other vessels dipped their flags in salute, the last international recognition the Confederate banner would receive. The Melbourne Herald proclaimed, peace is what Southerners ask for. Peace meaning recognition and a new empire. The Federals declare there shall be no peace without submission and their dictatorship. The South was engaged in a war of independence. The North had no more chance to conquer them than had Cornwallis. Australia need not trouble itself much either way, concluded the editors, but they wish to be clear on the subject. Europe had acknowledged the Confederate States as belligerents and ought to have declared the South an empire. <clears throat> it is ironic that sympathy for the Confederacy in Great Britain was concentrated in ruling elites of title and wealth, identifying with aristocratic Southerners and fearing Yankee democracy, the tyranny of the mob. While many people of Melbourne more in tune with radical politics and the expanding franchise, favored the South as a champion opposing tyrannical central government. These Melbournians were on the wrong side of the war and the right side of history. 19 February, 1865. Confederate troops evacuated the cradle of the Confederacy, Charleston, South Carolina, to the encircling host of General Sherman. On that same day, the CSS Shenandoah sailed from Melbourne repaired, resupplied, and with 45 new, illegal, crewmen. The people of Melbourne returned to routine, continu continuing a march to independence of their own, and a close friendship with the United States of America that endures to this day. 8 rebel commerce destroyers destro uh, took, destroyed over 100,000 tons of Union shipping, worth $17 million. But the major impact had been psychological, the real damage done by fear of capture. Marine insurance rates soared, reaching as high as 8% in 1863. Although one in 100 Yankee vessels actually was taken, another 800,000 tons, about 1,000 ships, were sold into foreign ownership to sail under the protection of a neutral flag, primarily Great Britain's. This was called the flight from the flag. It was a blow from which the United States Merchant Service never recovered. Despite these losses, however, rebel cruisers put not a dent in the industrial war machine of the United States or in the burgeoning trade that supported it. Commerce just shifted to neutral bottoms and whaling was ebbing anyway while the blockade progressively throttled the South. Fending off howls of protest from northern ship owners and shippers, Union Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells diverted only a few warships from the blockade to hunt Confederate cruisers. The USS Kearsarge sank Alabama only after she completed the most destructive cruise of the war and was too tired to continue. The USS Wachusett took the unsuspecting and unprepared Florida in Bahia Harbor 
only by an egregious violation of Brazilian neutrality. Shenandoah encircled the globe without being caught at all. Most other Confederate raiders were penned in neutral ports, confiscated before they could get underway, or decommissioned after unproductive cruisers. But this was also deliberate economic and psychological warfare, not unlike the strategy of William Tecumseh Sherman torching his way through Georgia and the Carolinas. In the fall of 1864, when Shenandoah began her cruise, Northerners were pessimistic about victory. Union desertion surged and the government was deep in debt. Bloodbaths at the wilderness, Spotsylvania and Cold Harbor, and a stalemate in the trenches around Petersburg brought a chorus of condemnation down on President Lincoln and General Grant. Pressure to negotiate peace was intense. The president despaired of winning re-election in November. In October 1864, when, when Shenandoah departed, Navy Secretary, Navy Secretary Mallory wrote to Commander James Bullock, his trusted chief purchasing agent in England, and the man responsible for acquiring Shenandoah. I trust that it has been in your power to carry out what I've long had so much at heart. The success of Shenandoah would be such an effective blow upon a vital interest as would be felt throughout New England. Bullock, a Georgian, is an unsung hero of the Confederacy. He thwarted persistent Union espionage and intense diplomatic pressure to launch Alabama, Florida, and Shenandoah, along with blockade runners crammed with hundreds of tons of arms and equipment, the layered rams, and the ironclad CSS Stonewall. He was justifiably proud of these accomplishments. He had been slated to command Alabama, but reluctantly retained his shore duties upon the request of Secretary Mallory. In a letter to Mallory, <coughs> Reporting Shenandoah's successful departure, Bullock remained convinced that, quote, a formidable naval expedition could be fitted out by the next summer of 1865. What if Shenandoah had cruised a year earlier, achieving the same results on top of the destruction already wrought by her sisters? How would news of another Alabama loose in the Pacific during the summer doldrums of 1864 have contributed to Northern malaise and to Lincoln's re-election <coughs> prospects. The Confederacy might have been as close to independence that summer as at any time during the war. This was not an irrational strategy. By the spring of 1865, however, when Shenandoah reached the Bering Strait, there could be no such hope. The CSS Shenandoah combined the epitome of an ancient ma maritime heritage with the most advanced technology of the time. She represented a new concept in an old strategy of naval warfare and was a good example of what a weaker naval power can accomplish in what we today call asymmetric warfare. The cruise also illustrates the difficulties of emerging states or revolutionary movements in claiming what they perceive as their rights and achieving accommodation in the international arena. The men of Shenandoah heeded the call of their leaders, putting their lives, fortunes, and honor on the line. They sought to serve in the best traditions of the U.S. Navy, from which several came and which they took as their model. Judging by their accomplishments, they succeeded. The peculiar tragedy of our civil war is that the opponents had so much in common and believed they were fighting for the same ideals. The Confederacy was a profound disaster, but the Americans of the South who took up arms with courage, dedication, and sacrifice were wrong, not evil. And their naval arm was a paradigm of innovation, creative strategy, and professionalism under, ne under nearly unmanageable circumstances. The Shenandoah and her men deserve to be remembered. Along with their Union counterparts, they have much to teach us. It is a Confederate biography and it's a great sea story. Thank you. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. A little bit more about perhaps the crew. I think you indicated a lot of them were recruited in Great Britain even. Yes, uh, the majority, a lot were recruited in Great Britain. Uh, and the majority recru were recruited from ships captured. They were virtually all of them foreigners, foreign merchant seamen who had to be recruited. 
uh, enticed with uh, high pay, gold coins, and, pr and promise of prize money, which of course they never received. Um, and the officers had, had a task in front of them to, to uh, lead these men and convince them of the, of the, uh, the right of the mission. And, uh, but it turns out that, that they, they actually served them very well. There were a few troubles, troublesome uh, men, as there always are. Uh, but these men actually served well and uh, got back to Liverpool successfully and, and um, um, Commander Bullock and, and Captain Waddell actually managed to even, we think, uh, pay them their, their pay. Uh, they had enough funds left to, to do that and they made a special point of doing it. So it's an interesting contrast, although these sailors have much in common with Union sailors. And sailors in general are very distinct from, from uh, soldiers. Uh, they came from different backgrounds, primarily um, urban, industrial backgrounds, and um, most of the time they, they, they were not inclined to ideological motivations. Um, but, however, once at sea, they, they came together as, sea, as uh, sailors do and, <coughs> and uh, did a good job. Thank you. Sure. Just kind of curious, uh, something like this d d certainly doesn't look to be heavily armed, is it? And we're just hiding the, hiding the gun ports? In other words, when they came up on these boats, uh, are you using your, your hired? Confederates, as it were, to uh, to do the, the fighting. For yeah, them. well, they had actually had um, eight guns, um, a couple and a couple, I think, nine-inch rifled cannons and a couple and four thirty-two pound smooth bores. Um, they actually are pretty well armed. You can see the gun ports right here. Um, the only Yankee ship who had any chance of catching catching them was the USS Iroquois. And she was a sister ship um, of the um, ship that uh, sunk the Alabama. The Kearsarge. The Kearsarge, yes. And actually the two were, not, were, were, were fairly evenly matched. If they had ever met, it would, it would have been a fairly even match. Except, sort of like Sims' crew on the Alabama, these sailors uh, were, were, again, foreign merchant sailors. They were not trained at the guns. Well, that's right. That's why I was asking the question. <laughs> They, Are you they, sending a ship out to chase down the mm -hmm. the enemy, as it were? Right. The, the well, they had no intention of encountering a Union warship if they could avoid it. Uh, they worked very. They worked hard to trade, uh, train the sailors, and they did a lot of practice firing. Uh, but they were never were confident, and they never really wanted to put it to the test. And as it happens, they didn't. They never had to. <coughs> yes, sir. Question about their operations. Did they, like the Germans would do in the World Wars, try and hide their identity, or were they very much a warship at sea? Because that would have been a very oh, oh yes, oh yes, they did, and that's one of the advantages of being a clipper ship. They they could hide their identity pretty well, and and it was standard practice for for privateers and commerce raiders to to approach a, a possible uh, prey under <coughs> under a foreign flag, and they did that all the time. That they, they flew primarily the English flag, or, or, or occasionally uh, they flew the American flag. And <laughs> but international law said you could you could approach a target with a foreign flag, but once you got along, got up close to them and you fired your gun, you had to put up your own flag, uh, otherwise you were a pirate. And they and they uh, they tried very hard to do that, and and, and they did that. Yeah. Yes, sir. Approximately how many were in the crew? Well, um, he had a lot of trouble getting enough men, and that was one of one of the more serious problems. He started off uh, when he first commissioned the ship. He only had about thirty um, that were enticed to uh, join um, off the crew that came down from from uh, London with them to to Madeira, and off the store ship that they that came down from Liverpool to load their guns on. <clears throat> That's why they loaded the guns and armed her up down in Madeira rather than England. They, they, they would have been seized if they'd done that. Um, but, and then he recruited crewmen from various prizes they took, and as I said, they got some in, in uh, Melbourne, and um, I think he ended up uh, you know, about 100, 120, something like that. I mean, he, that, that was the crew he wanted. Uh, um, 
a, a, a standard clipper ship would never have had that many men, uh, but he needed more men to man the guns and, and presumably for prize crews and things like this. Yes, sir. Sir, could you uh, discuss the uh, sources that you used in compiling the book? Well, yes, the sources were fascinating, and that's one of the things that really got me into this. There are four cruise journals and two memoirs uh, were my primary source, so I went back to them, and at the time I started this project, which was over 20 years ago, nothing much had really been written about the Shenandoah, and I discovered a copy of the first lieutenant's cruise journal at the Virginia Historical Society. It had never been it had never been quoted, it had never been published or anything. I thought, wow, great. So I got started on it. By the time I got close to finish it, some other people published some books on it. But, um, and then there were, th then there were three others, the, the ship's doctor, one of the midshipmen, and um, one of the other lieutenants. And it was a matter, it was just a fascinating matter, kind of collating their views. And that's what I tried to do, is just to see it through their eyes and write it from their perspective. And um, I quote them a lot, of course, but even, even a lot of the material that is not direct quotes is condensed and, and summarized using their words and their phraseology and describing it as they saw it. So I, that was so much, what was so much fun about it. And of course, there's so much good material on the Civil War that uh, it, uh, you don't have to do uh, a whole, whole lot of background research. Yes, sir. With the number of international sailors, was a, uh, a problem with English language much of a, a concern? <laughs> or did they all speak well, English? Well, it was with some. Uh, the, as it turned out, a lot of the senior warrant officers, like the bosun and the carpenter and, and, uh, and so on, were English. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, the bosun was a, um, uh, he, he was a, uh, a, a Royal Navy pensioner and a Royal Navy reservist. So he was, he, he was out of his, but he was a great guy. He actually, he actually served on the Alabama also. Um, some of the crewmen they had trouble with, uh, yeah, they got some of, they had some Germans and some Portuguese and some Pacific Islanders, primarily Hawaiians, that they recruited off some of the whalers. And one of the, the midshipmen complains about how much trouble he had getting the Kanakas to understand their, their roles at the guns. But they were trying, he said, so he just worked with them. <laughs> Thank you. How did they handle the logistics at the, say the last three months and after the period, after the war was over, uh, did they just use money to buy their way through as a result of their... Well, they, they took most of their supplies from, from, their, from their prizes. And as I said, in, in, for instance, in the, in, in the Bering Sea, they captured 24 whalers. Whalers have tons of, carry tons of supplies because they're out for months at a time. So it's, it, it is one of the interesting things that they actually, they actually lived pretty well and, and ate pretty well uh, because of all the good food and other supplies they got off their prizes. That's one of the reasons the sailors did like the ship. They, they, they got good food. They, they, didn't have, they didn't have to eat hardtack and water all the time or, or, or uh, hardtack and grog, although they loved their grog too. Uh, the, the Confederate Navy was, was still a wet Navy. The U.S. Navy had gone dry in 1862, but the Confederate Navy was not. Sir? I believe you, I believe you said that she had steam propulsion. Yes. And uh, some of the pictures don't show a stack. Is ah. the stack removable? The stack was collapsible. Oh. It's hard to see here, but it is right there. But it's, it, it's lowered when they're under sail to reduce drag. It's just telescoping. Does this could change the identity of it? Well, it could, yes. And that's one of the reasons when they, when they approached a target, they would lower it so they didn't look like they had steam. Would they use that in battle or would they? Uh, they if they needed to, yeah. In the Bering Strait, the wind died out and there were, there were about a dozen whalers sitting there in a little fleet and uh, they steamed right up and took them. Yeah, the, the steam was, was very much an advantage for them. Uh, to uh, and when they had uh, uh, contrary winds or low winds. How much and, horsepower? Um, 850, I think, something like that. I'm not sure. They, they said it, it said it could do about nine knots. It, it, it was a pretty good steam engine. Yeah. Although I, I couldn't find out as much about it as I was hoping to, but there are minor records on it. 
But that sort of brings up the question of the fuel, the coal. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> they didn't have a collier, where did they go? Well, that, that was another uh, a problem or a difficulty they had to face. Uh, they brought with them from London um, an extra, I think, 200 tons of coal, which was stored on the, on the, what came the berth deck in a clipper ship would be the tween decks, would be the deck above the holes. So they brought a, a bunch of coal with them, much more than, than uh, they would normally have carried. And then um, that got them down to Melbourne. They got more coal in Melbourne. Um, and then um, they were all right after that uh, because they relied on their sails as much as possible um, and um, got back to, uh, they were running low by the time they got back to Liverpool, but uh, fortunately they got enough to keep them going. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened to the officers after the Civil War? We, a, a number of them went to South America uh, and Brazil and uh, the ship's doctor went to Mexico and actually s served under Maximilian for a while, but that didn't last long, of course. Um, and uh, the captain, uh, Waddell, stayed in, stayed in England. His wife came over and he stayed there for a long time. Um, but they all eventually made their way back and, and, um, and they started careers at home and, and actually they had, they all had pretty, pretty productive careers. Uh, a couple of them became lawyers. Um, um, the one lieutenant who's, who was a South Carolinian and whose father had had some big plantations, his father had actually been a signer of the secession proclamation in, in, in South Carolina. He was, so he was a member of the aristocracy. He actually got some of his land back and, and was, was able to continue uh, working it. So um, they, all, they all did pretty well once they got back. It was a few years. They, they stayed away for a few years until things settled down. But they, they, they did not know that they, that they, that they would not be uh, tried as pirates. And, and they, they were concerned about that. Um, <clears throat> Once they found out, they had been getting some newspapers off their captured ships, and they got some in, in, when they were in the Bering Strait, and they got some news when they were in Melbourne. But of course, um, they were weeks old. And um, a lot of it they didn't believe, and a lot of the newspaper reporting was very contradictory and confusing anyway. Uh, when they were in the Bering Straits, they did get news of Lee's surrender, and then, in, and then finally Lincoln's assassination. Well. They, they absolutely refused to believe the news that leads to surrender. They just said, it's all lies. We don't believe it. And Lincoln's assassination, they were just shocked by. And their, their immediate reaction was, the Confederacy didn't do this. And, and, and you know, hope, we hope that the Confederacy doesn't suffer because of it. Um, so um, did that answer the question? <laughs> Does that wonder again? Yes, sir. Did they carry a head of steam so that they could get underway instantly? Or? Oh, they did when they when they thought they needed to, but um, uh, normally underway they would not. Well, um, depends on what the weather was doing and where they were. Uh, they they would um, they would clear. Uh, they were water tube boilers, and they would clear the fires and water out of the boilers occasionally to clean them and so on. Most of the time, they, 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 they probably maintained some low banked fires if they thought they would need steam so that they could get up steam uh, pretty quickly. I, I think they, they didn't very often let the boilers go cold, uh, except when they were in Melbourne, of course, and when they were at anchor in, in, in Pompeii. Yes? Uh, now, this was the period of the first ironclads, right? The French yeah. and then the yes. Warrior, Black French and so forth. Uh, was this an ironclad at all? No, no, it was, it was built as a clipper ship. Uh, so um, it was what they called a composite clipper. It had iron frames, um, iron frames and stanchions and, and, and knees, so that it had a lot more space inside than, than a traditional clipper. Um, and, um, but it was planked with, with teak, six inches of teak, and, and then, then sheathed in copper. So it actually was a better hull for those times than the iron hulls. It had better protection from marine organiz organisms and growth, um, and, uh, and was more, it, it lasted longer. Uh, it was more expensive to build, 
but um, it, it was built right at the height of the of the uh, uh, of the British tea clipper building, and 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 for that reason is really a magnificent example of the type. Uh, the only really unusual and the unusual thing about it is that it had a steam engine, but. Um, as I said, it's it's very similar to the Cuddy Sark, um, and it's 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 a little, it was a little hard for me to get my head around that, that a clipper ship was used as a warship, but that's what happened. I, I think there were a couple other clipper ships that were used as blockaders at one point, but of course they they, they were not terribly effective. Is that completely unique? This teak uh, the planking on the hull. I don't think it's completely unique. Um, I think it was one of the one of the higher end configurations uh, for the uh, for the Glasgow ship shipbuilders, but um, I'm not sure. Of course, it's a very very good thing to plank a hull with. Um, but they were real concerned about going into ice. Uh, the 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 uh, whalers that the the Arctic whalers were built much stronger. Their 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 stems were reinforced and they had thicker planking. Uh, to, uh, to to stand the ice, and uh, but they had some really scary uh, adventures uh, up in the ice, and were very leery of of, uh, of getting hulled by the ice or getting their rudder knocked off, and they almost did on a couple of occasions. But still, for for a, a, a clipper ship of the time, it really was um, you know the epitome of the technology, and then the T clippers are probably the most uh, Beautiful machines ever built. I mean, they're, they're really something. I, you know, I think a lot about my days on the bridge, and I had a fair number of them. And I spent so much time on the quarter deck with these guys. Now, you know, my my mental images got, got all kind of get merged. I, uh, my my mental images of standing on the quarter deck of the Shenandoah are almost as vivid as being on the bridge of the Kitty Kitty Hawk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah. Sir, what was her what was her final fate? Well, um, the British uh, turned her over to the Union authorities in Liverpool uh, at their request. Uh, the uh, the uh, American ambassador there, Charles Francis Adams, wanted them to turn over the officers too, but they and they didn't have any reason to to prosecute them, and they didn't want to get involved in that anyway. But it was turned over to the to the U.S. The U.S. Tr hired a crew and captain to sail her back. Uh, they got into some storms, and the captain had trouble with the engines, and he was a he was a wind sailor anyway. He turned back, and finally they sold her to the Sultan of Zanzibar as a yacht. <laughs> and, and, and and the other thing about these 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 Glasgow Clippers is they were very richly appointed inside. And, and very, you know, mahogany paneling and the whole bit. And I, we don't have any pictures of the inside of the Shenandoah. We suspect it was it was pretty nice. Um, and um, so the Sultan Zanzibar had her as a yacht for a number of years. She got caught in a hurricane off the coast of uh, of, of East Africa and uh, and was uh, eventually sunk. So right now she's on the bottom of the Indian Ocean somewhere. <laughs> Okay. okay. That's great. Thank you. Thank you.